So uh, I'm sure like Dr. Venkatesh has already covered uh, the management of PCR and he has covered certain principles. So certain basics uh, are covered in this slide. So the uh, aim of an anterior vitrectomy will be uh, to remove all the vitreous from the anterior chamber and maintain a normotensive globe. Second, at the end of your surgery, there should be no vitreous incarcerated in the wound. Third, protect all the other collateral tissues. No damage to the cornea, no damage to the iris. Maximum uh, PC support, if at all you're leaving the case without IL implantation. If possible, securely place an intraocular lens. So that will be our aim of vitrectomy. So as already discussed, we always prefer a bimanual vitrectomy. Why? Because in a coaxial vitrectomy, so there is irrigation and aspiration at the same port. So when there is irrigation and aspiration at the same port, the vitreous will get hydrated. So as the vitreous gets hydrated, more amount of vitreous will be coming into the, out of the tear, it will also enlarge and it will be difficult for us to manage. So it's always good to separate irrigation and aspiration and the vitrectomy. So in coaxial vitrectomy, there's a small animation which shows how it works. So the irrigation in the, on either sides, and this is the aspiration port. So as you see, so when both are there in the same port, so it will be hydrating the vitreous, and it will be difficult for you to cut the vitreous also. So whereas in bimanual vitrectomy, uh, so we are having a separate side port for the irrigation and separate side, side port for a cutter. So the irrigation is always maintained anteriorly. So what happens is when your saline is uh, poured in the anterior uh, chamber, so it gives a positive pressure. It will make sure that the vitreous is pushed back always. And you go with the vitrector just under the posterior capsule and start your vitrectomy. So that irrigation is also not hydrating. It is also giving you a positive pressure in order to push the vitreous back. So that happens in bimanual vitrectomy. So as you see, so here is the vitreous in the anterior chamber. The cutter is just behind the tear and the irrigation is maintaining the chamber anteriorly. So the irrigation should not be oriented towards the tear. It should be always uh, towards above the iris and towards the angle a little bit. So it, sh it should not be obstructing your view also and it should be away from the your place where you are actually working on the vitrectomy and also it should also serve the uh, purpose of maintaining the chamber. Just if I manual, would you prefer through the main port or you will prefer through two side ports? Yeah, so bimanual is always through two side ports. We always prefer to close the main wound. But in FACO, some surgeons, if you feel that uh, if it is, some surgeons also go use the one FACO wound as uh, for a vitrectomy and the other side port for an irrigation. Like, uh, for ease of handling. But if you're doing an SICS, always make sure that the main wound is sealed properly so that the chamber is closed. So that is the aim before starting the vitrectomy. You are, have to make sure that the chamber is closed. So how will you know, know that the chamber is closed? Only when you have a self-sealing main incision. If it is not a self-sealing main incision, better suture it. So another time when the main wound will not be closed is when there's already a lot of vitreous in the wound. So what will you do then? So you will have to cut whatever vitreous is there on the wound side. So that is called vexel vitrectomy. So in the vexel vitrectomy also, you are not supposed to actually hold the vitreous and just lift up and see for strands. You are not playing with a strand there. Because if you start lifting up your vitreous strand, then you will be causing more amount of traction. So what are the main areas where it is strongly attached? Vitreous. Strongly attached to the vitreous base as well as the optic nerve. So most common it will be uh, coming out from the vitreous base if you pull hard. So you'll have to do a flush vexel vitrectomy. So after you've done a flush vexel vitrectomy, take your spatula, sweep the vitreous, push it in the center, put little amount of visco on the wound side in order to push whatever vitreous was there into the chamber, center of the chamber and then start the vitrectomy. So if at all your wound is not uh, sealed properly, suture the main wound and then go with the vitrectomy. So that is what is uh, uh, given here. So waking video. So if you see if when you are pulling so hard it is coming out from the vitreous space and the next side will be from the optic nerve and the other areas will be around the vessels, retinal vessels also. So do not sweep the incision. Okay, when you are even when you are 
actually taking your spatula to see whether vitreous is there in the chamber or not, we tend to actually sweep with the cyclospatula here and there. So do not sweep much. So your aim is to just sweep the vitreous which was actually coming into the wound into the chamber. So confirm, so after this, uh, we'll actually go to the vitrectomy procedure as such. So all those things are coming in details. So once you have set all the vitrectomy machines, you should confirm whether uh, irrigation is happening or not, cutting is happening. So and third uh, position will be the aspiration. So foot pedal one, two and three. So when you're setting it in cut IA, your foot pedal two will be cut, foot pedal three will be aspiration. But if you are setting it in IA cut, your foot pedal 2 will be IA and third will be aspiration. FP1, foot pedal 1 is always irrigation. So what do you prefer for vitrectomy? You prefer a cut IA or an IA cut? You always prefer a cut IA because you want the vitreous to be cut first and then only you want it to be aspirated. So maximize the cut rate. So always remember you want the highest cut rate possible which is being offered by your FACO machine whatever the highest cut rate. So because the vitreous has to be cut in highermost speed, otherwise if you're going to cut in pulse modes, again you'll be causing traction on the vitreous. So it, it has to be cut and aspirated, and aspirated once you're sure that it is cut from the posterior attachments. And minimize the flow rate. Balance the lowest effective vacuum with lowest bottle height. So low vacuum, low bottle height, highest cut rate. So that is the funda. Remove all the vitreous from the anterior chamber till the posterior plane and minimally disrupt the posterior segment with this structure. So that will be your aim. So this we already saw. So in vitrectomy mode, I, uh, irrigation, cut and IA. We already saw that. So FP1 will be only irrigating. In all three modes, uh, foot pedal positions, irrigation will be happening. Okay. So what will be the vitrectomy parameters if you see? For vitrectomy, we use only the cut IA. In laureate, the maximum 1,500 uh, cuts per minute, and infinity 2,500, and centurion 4,000. And the vacuum will always be fixed, but little lower, like as you keep for epinuclear sheet, or little lesser than that, 250. Aspiration rate will be 20 cc per minute. That will also be fixed, and bottle height irrigation will be 55. Whereas an IA cut, so when do you prefer an IA cut once? You have done all your vitrectomy, so no vitreous in the vicinity. So now you are proceeding for a remaining cortex removal. So that is when you use an IA cut for the remaining cortex removal. So the settings will be, so the cut rate has to go down. Only for cutting the vitreous, your cut rate has to be higher. Whereas for the cortex, you want a minimal cut rate. Then vacuum, you fix it in linear mode. So that is one change which we are doing. For a vitrectomy, you have fixed vacuum, whereas for cortex, you have a linear vacuum. Otherwise, the settings are going to be the same. So getting started with vitrectomy, so we'll see that uh, video. So this is the cutter. This is the irrigation, which is being maintained in the anterior chamber. So the cutter is going just below the posterior capsule, and you're starting to cut the vitreous. So make sure that you are uh, always seeing the aspiration port. The aspiration sh port should be faced upwards because when you have, when it is down, you tend to actually go a little more deeper also. You will not know what you are cutting. You might tend to pull also. You will always have to be aware that you are cutting. And as Dr. Venkatesh mentioned, so you will not move your vitrectomy cutter when you are in foot pedal 3 or 1 also. So either one or three, you're not moving. Only when you're cutting, you can move, okay? Because even in one, in irrigation mode, some vitreous might be clogged to the port. So even in aspira aspiration though, it's like really a no, strict no. Even in one also, you better not move. Only when you're in foot pedal two, when you're cutting the vitreous, you can actually move. Maximum, you don't try to go into the peripheries. You try to stay, stay wherever you're seeing, in the central, not more deeper also. In order to avoid, major complications. So this we already uh, saw. So temporary closure of the main incision, make a new parasynthesis for the vitrectomy probe, advance the cutter towards the vitreous while cutting, hold the eye steady, tilt the vitrector below the posterior capsule, anticipate a repeat. So whenever you're starting a, a, a vitrectomy, definitely there'll be more amount of vitreous coming. Don't panic. Okay, because whenever you 
when you first see a PC rent and a vitreous, you might not see much of vitreous, but when you go a little deeper, definitely there's more amount of, there will be more amount of vitreous coming, so anticipate it, don't panic. So irrigating through the side port incision is ideal. Do not move the vitrector through the vitreous without cutting, stay in FP2. Goal is to preserve as much of vitreous. So vitrectomy mode, uh, so we already went through the vitrectomy mode uh, settings. So there's a small video which shows us uh, uh, what all we should be aware of before going inside the eye, so we'll see that. Um, so completing the vitrectomy is, uh, once you're sure that everything is done, you have cut everything, then you can go to FP3 and aspirate all the cut vitreous, okay? So to move this we already saw, readjust the location of the port to address any other areas of vitreous prolapse. Do not move the vitrector around vitreous without being in FP2. At the end, hold the vitrector still, come to FP0, that is in the irrigation mode. Remove the irrigation cannula and inject diluted triamcinolone into the anterior chamber in order to see whether any remnants are there or not. Place the irrigator through the paracentesis and come to FP1 to disperse the triamcinolone, thereby confirming the complete absence. So here, most commonly, we are not using the uh, triamcinolone. So the triamcinolone comes as a preservative-free one because in a preserved one, there's benzyl alcohol, which is actually toxic to the eye. So we take a preservative-free. It comes as 40 milligram per ml. You'll have to dilute in the ratio of 1 is to 10 and take 1 ml of it, and then you can use it inside the eye. Uh, what can be the maximum side effects of triamcinolone tricotis retained tricot inside the eye? Because these are like small crystals which actually go and stay, uh, uh, clog between the collagen bundles and that is how we, uh, we are able to see the vitreous more clearly. So if at all it stays back, there's a risk of high IOP and maximum cataract formation, but good that we are taking the cataract out. So. How do you know that whenever you're coming out of the eye after you've done a vitrectomy, so your irrigation should always be there. There should, at no point, the anterior chamber should suddenly collapse. So that point, I think so many times everyone would have told you. So before taking the irrigation cannula out, you'll have to put visco, fill the chamber partly, and then only you'll have to take the irrigation cannula out. So, and then uh, put some myocol in the end, that is pilocarpin in the end, and see for uh, pupil constricting. If, we, if there are residual vitreous inside the eye, there will be peaking of vitreous strands. So what you can do is again pull, take a spatula, either cut with one ass or do a repeat vitrectomy. So we'll just see a cut IA video. So cut IA is for vitrectomy. So here is a PCR and the probe is actually face down and they're doing some vitrectomy around the area of tear. So if you see the cut rate is 800. Do not try to aspirate the cortex when you are in cut IA mode, okay? Okay, so this is what I was talking about, anterior vitrectomy setup. So remember the checklist, machine consumables, and SICS or ECC instrument set. Yeah, set to tenonylon sutures because you want it to close the incision, additional viscoelastics, and viscoat also, and triamcinolone, and three-piece IOL. Or ACOL, ACOL we are not uh, uh, using it in our setup. So, as they already mentioned, when there is a PCR, do not pa panic. Tell yourself, teach yourself to remain calm. So if you are in a beginning stage, you can call the senior to come and manage, close the incision, do not do more of damage, no collateral damage. So we, it is for the patient we are doing, so remember that. So and if you are familiar with vitrectomy, then you should alert the assistants to actually bring all the instruments and keep, uh, all the uh, settings ready. And uh, also remember, like Dr. Venktesh mentioned, the patient remembers each word, whatever you tell, because there are so many patients whom have, we have seen, it is not because of the CME or the six by nine or six by 12 vision they are worried. It is because of the anxiety which they had during the surgery, because they feel that there was something went wrong. 
so something went wrong so that thing should not you should not create that panicky or a uh, bad thing which is which has happened during the surgery that should not be translated to the patient you should always maintain your composure and also patient also so if at all the patient is in a topical uh, anesthesia convert it to subtenon anesthesia or a local anesthesia make sure that the patient is relieved of pain because if there is a pcr and then patient is trying to squeeze the eye then there's there there there'll be even more problems which is going to happen so make sure that the patient and your assistant is comfortable for you to do a complete and a successful vitrectomy so as we already discussed fp is brought to position 1 that is the irrigation mode take some dispersive viscoelastics like visco to plug the pcr and then lower the bottle height so before withdrawing the second uh, instrument i mean withdraw the second instrument before withdrawing the first instrument you'll have to put viscoat and then remove the hand piece so then you're taking the uh, vitrectomy probe so in infinity we have a pneumatic cutter so in pneumatic cutters you'll have two ports whereas in uh, centurion you have only one port right two 20 gauge and this is 23 gauge if you have two ports it is 23 gauge if it is only one port it is 20 gauge okay so this is the aspiration line which is connected to that blue tubing and this is the irrigation tube so which will be connected to the hydro cannula so you separate it and then so verify the probe type first and then connect the aspiration tubing connect the irrigating cannula this is the aspiration irrigating cannula then press fill so once filling is done then you test so how do you test you put some bss in a ball and then with the lowest cut rate see whether the cutter is moving or not if you have a highest cut rate it will be moving very fast you will not be able to identify whether it is cutting or not so lowest cut rate see whether it's moving so then set for highest cut rate low vacuum low bottle height and low aspiration flow rate 20 so all aspiration flow rate and vacuum in fixed mode and then you go for the vitrectomy so cut ia for anterior vitrectomy and ia cut for cortex removal whereas in laureate so manually you lower the bottle height and then this will be an electric cutter so you put the connect the probe and then so you open the cutter so it has a hand piece and a disposable cutter the white thing is a cutter and the other one is a hand piece so this is the hand piece so once uh, the vitrectomy cutter is connected to the hand piece so you tighten it and then the tubings of your uh, uh, phaco probe is removed and then this is the aspiration tubing line so that is connected here so remove the aspiration and irrigation line from the phaco probe and the connect the aspiration tubing to this vitrectomy cutter and the irrigation line with the hydro cannula Okay, so in Laurier, the maximum cut rate is thousand five hundred. So cut IA mode for anterior vitrectomy. So if you see the irrigation is maintained in the anterior chamber, and with the vitrector you go a little posteriorly. So this we've already discussed. So this we've already discussed. So um, can we go to that? Uh, principles of manage uh, ma management of pcr we we'll just run a quick uh, presentation of it don't worry i'll finish in 5 minutes okay so early recognition so always your anterior hyaloid phase will be intact at most of the time so when you if you recognize your pc rent in a very early stage even your anterior hyaloid phase might be intact and you will not even get a vitreous out so early recognition is very important 
then recognize the uh, risk factor. So this we've already mentioned. So sudden pupillary browns, suddenly the pupil will dilate and the vitreous will be coming out because there's an equalization of hydrostatic pressure between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. Suddenly you might see a clear red reflex. Suddenly you might feel that your phaco probe is not trenching properly. Pieces are not getting aspirated. You're not able to, uh, fallability is not there. So the routine things whichever happen will not happen. And there might be a slight tilt of the nucleus equator. Suddenly some pieces can disappear. So, and there can be a peak pupil. Especially when you are after your hydro dissection, when you are trying to rotate, you might not be able to rotate properly. There will be su some difficulty in rotating your, your nucleus. So these are some signs when nucleus is actually there inside the uh, eye. So if, if it happens during IOL placement, your IOL can get decentered. Or in the end of the case, when you are closing, if it is not forming properly, your wound is not sealing tightly. Or if there is a peaking pupil. So these are all signs that there's something wrong. But above all this, if you have a gut feeling that something went wrong, then 100% there is a PCR. So remember that. So if you have a gut feeling that something is wrong, relax, keep calm, see whether everything is right, or you, you can even call a senior to make sure that everything is right, and then proceed with the case. Most of the time, before a PCR happening, your gut feeling will be the first one to tell you that there is something wrong. So this we have already uh, mentioned. So this OVD compartmentali uh, compartmentalization technique, so what will you do immediately is, so you will do a reverse soft shell technique here. So when there is a PCR, so this is a PCR. So what you do is, first you place a dispersive viscoelastic, that is a viscoat on the PC. So only if you place a dispersive viscoelastic, the PC won't go down. So Dispersive viscoelastic will be syrupy and it will coat, okay? It will coat the layers. Cohesive is the one which will fill the anterior chamber. So first put a dispersive in that area. So dispersive viscoelastic will be difficult to remove. That is why we are actually plugging it there. And then you place a cohesive viscoelastic like provisc. So dispersive is viscoat. First you put viscoat and then you put a provisc in order to fill the AC and then it will push and it will plug. Okay, so this is what happens in a reverse soft shell technique. In a soft shell technique, we try to put a viscoat that will coat the endothelium up and then you put the provisc in order to fill the AC. Okay, so that, that is what we routinely do for phaco emulsification. We do a reverse one here. So once you have got a PCR, you should assess the situation. At what situation has the PCR happened? So first use a Kuglenz hook. St see, see, retract the pupil on all sides and see whether rim is intact or not, whether the capsule is intact or not, where the PCR has happened. So all those things you'll have to see. And then if you're planning to convert it into an SICS in order to remove, like large amount of nucleus is there. So most often I would tell all my, uh, I mean the beginners to actually convert it. So if it is a FACO and you're having a PCR, close the FACO incision and go to a superior site, make a superior scleral tunnel and first try to take the nucleus out. So we don't want a nucleus drop to happen. So that is the first thing which should, you should do. So most often when you're converting it into an SICS wound, most often what we'll forget is we would not have done an enough capsular exercise for a SICS. So we would have done a small capsular exercise for a FACO. So when you're trying to take out the nucleus, so you should not come to the superior size and try to hydro it or hook it. If you're going to hook or hydro it, you might cause a zonal dialysis or it might not come properly also. So give some relaxing cuts on the capsule rexis so that it little bit it enlarges and then don't try to do a hydro dissection because already you know that there's something wrong. So try to hook the nucleus, whatever the size of the nucleus, it might be a soft nucleus also, even if you just take the nucleus out, it's, it's okay. You can actually take the cortex a little bit later also. So take how much ever is possible and try to take. And when you are trying to take out through the main node also, remember that you can't uh, pull the superior rectus or press the superior lip because you will be inject and irrigating the saline, the three steps which we do for nucleus delivery, that you can't be doing. So you should actually make a large enough scleral tunnel. You will have to make a large enough section in order to um, give l the least uh, pressure possible in order to take the nucleus out. So all those things you'll have to rem remember and then go for a vitrectomy. So once you have taken the major part of the nucleus out 
and even if some cortex are remaining, don't worry because the cortex will be in leaflets. It won't actually fall into the vitreous and go off. Only the loose materials you will have to take off. So now after you have removed major part of the nucleus out, you will know, now you will be able to identify where the rent is. So in that time you can put viscote in that special area and then try it. What I would say is I never do a bimanual cortex aspiration at all whenever there is a PCR. I always prefer to put viscote, put lot of visco HPMC. So you plug the PCR area and do a, do a dry cortex aspiration with a Simco cannula. So that will, you will have a wonderful control with your uh, uh, thumb, you, you will be having the control. So in a bimanual, the machine is controlling, whereas in a Simco, you will be controlling and you will know whether PCR is enlarging or not, whether you can actually back flush it. So Simco with dry cortex aspiration is the best according to my experience and in my hands. So after you've done that, if at all, there are little bit of nucleus remnants there, cortical remnants there, which you have to definitely fake it if you feel, if you have to fake it, what you can do is move it away, the farthest away from the rent area possible and then try to do a slow motion FACO. So slow motion FACO parameters will be low flow, moderate vacuum and short pulses just to uh, eat only that specific area. So whenever you're doing this, always you should al also have an eye on area on the PCR also. You act nicely coated with visco, put some visco about it and then do a slow motion FACO little bit away from the area of PCR and also make sure that your bottle height is less. So conversion to ECC we already saw, triumphs alone we saw. So this we saw. So managing the drop nucleus, do not try to fish the nucleus out because if you try to fish the nucleus out, you might cause a retinal detachment. Uh, the best outcomes can be given by a retinal surgeon. So transfer to the retinal surgeon. So residual cortex uh, removal, so bimanual irrigation aspiration also imparts a small risk of incarcerating vitreous. It might also take the vitreous also out. But if there is no irrigation, you put lot of visco in the chamber and just you know where the cortex is, just hold the cortex and bring, there will be no vitreous incarceration at all. So that is why a dry technique is the best. And implanting the IOL, so make sure that you have an adequate support uh, and then try to implant an IOL. I think that is a separate class which has to be taken for implanting an IOL. I think Sir showed some videos. So if there is good amount of support, anterior capsule support, then you can actually decently place it in the uh, sulcus. Uh, if there is a very linear PCR or a small central PCR, then definitely you can place it in the back, especially with a good memory IOL like Acrisoft, uh, Dr. has uh, Dr. Venkesh mentioned. So these are like whenever you are placing a sulcus IOL, you should always remember that you should implant an IOL power of uh, less, less than 0.5 diopters mostly for lenses from plus 9.5 to minus uh, plus 17. So plus 9.5 to plus 17, minus 1 diopter less for plus 17.5 to 27 because the effective lens position is changing. So from the back it is actually going up. But if you're planning to, if, if you don't have those kind of options available, you can always place it in the sulcus, do an optic capture. So what is an optic capture? You push it behind little bit so that it is coming under the rim of the uh, capsule. So it will uh, be little bit equal to uh, as good as place, placing it in the back. So wound closure, before uh, closing the wound, make sure that there is uh, no vitreous at all in the anterior chamber. So uh, as we already discussed about it, you place some pilomel, uh, constrict the pupil, that is the best way. So if, you can, if the pupil is not constricting at all, then it means a lot of vitreous is there in the uh, AC. Uh, if it is constricting well, but it is speaking, uh, then, you should, then there is a small strand. Uh, you need not actually take a vitrector to actually cut it, you can also cut it with one as that strand will actually go back inside into the vitreous. And always close the wound with tenonylon suture as much as possible and this is very important you should definitely disclose whatever has happened to your patient because like uh, one of my best patient is the patient whom I had PCR so they they uh, they feel very happy that what the truth had been told to them and you should also make sure that you're taking care of the patient also postoperatively well 
So they'll, they'll definitely be not worried about the complication or you have placed a different lens, nothing would bother them. But your proper declaration to them is more important because I've seen patients who, uh, who were not aware that there was a PCR and they had kept a, a different lens and then they go to a different doctor and they say that there is a PCR, there's a defect, then it becomes a big uh, uh, disappointment for the patient as well as the doctor. So it's always better for the patient also to know that they had a complication so that they'll also be more careful in taking the post-operative. Like you'll have to give a course of uh, antibiotics, oral antibiotics, you'll have to add an NSAID also post-operatively. Make sure you'll have to do an OCT macular in one month and six months to make sure there is no systemic ma cystoid macular edema. So all these things, only if you inform the patient, they'll also come for regular follow-up to you and you can also make sure that everything has um, taken care properly because anyways, the patient has to be taken for a retina clinic opinion, which is not the normal procedure. So they know that there is something different happening. So rather than getting to know from somebody else as a surgeon, it is our responsibility to take care of the patient and also warn them of possibility of floaters and everything will be become all right. So it's not a big mistake. It's not a big sin that we did. Like it, everything happens. So you'll have to face it. So good surgeon is one who faces their complication boldly and brings success out of it, okay? So post-operative follow-up, we'll have to take care of all these things. So when we are well prepared and equipped for an unexpected PCR and vitreous loss and manage the patient meticulously, we can definitely offer uh, optimal outcomes for the patient even in complicated cataract cases. Thank you. Any 